uh, thank you for the introduction. I'm going to introduce also myself. But uh, as you've been uh, uh, as it has been said, today's lecture is about atmosphere in games and immersion in general. So let's start. Uh, first thing is why am I here? I First of all, we would like to thank for the invitation because we have been invited over here to speak about this and also do a little bit of a promotional thing about our <laughs> game religion, which we highly recommend you test out. It's available on Steam and we're very proud of it, so to say. And first of all, I am a game designer. I have uh, almost 10 years of experience in that area and I am also a dungeon master for more than 15 years with which for some reason in game dev is very important and helps people a lot, especially in creating uh, valuable stories. And uh, currently I'm working, of course, in Icecode games, but let's go to the presentation itself. Uh, we're gonna touch five main topics today. First of all, we will discuss what is immersion because it is used all around the internet, people have different definitions for it, so let's establish what do we understand by uh, immersion itself and why it has so many different definitions. The, the second part will be uh, around world building. What we can do to actually create something that is believable, something that the players will enjoy, and even if it's a fantasy setting, how to make it real for us. Uh, third part will be around non-playable characters, which is almost everyone that you encounter in a game that is not you, and how we can use them to boost the story, boost the world, boost everything almost in the world itself and in the game itself. Uh, lastly, we're going to touch the characters and the story. Uh, when we're going to discuss characters, we will mostly focus on who is the protagonist. Is he someone just the main character of the game or is he something more important uh, in games in general? What makes a hero? Why do we need an avatar like this? And lastly, uh, story, we're going to talk about how to maintain a proper tempo in a game, how to make a uh, valuable story, something that we will both understand and enjoy. Okay, so let's get to the meat of the subject. First, what is immersion? As you might probably have heard it a lot of times uh, on the internet, on forums, people say uh, that a game is immersive, somebody found something immersive, but there is no one single definition of what it means. Basically, it is because when we discuss immersion, we, on, we discuss our feelings, what we feel that is good, what we feel that captured our imagination or made us believe that the story that we're uh, actually playing now is uh, valuable or is in any way interesting for us. Uh, immersion, in short words, is that moment when you lose your sense of time, you forget that you're playing a game, you are the character. This is the most basic definition that one can create about what is immersion. But why do we have so many definitions? Ma mainly because if we would discuss it right now, we would have different games that we thought it were immersive. And sometimes uh, one person would say they found it very creative, the other person would say, I, n I didn't. So the fact that we uh, are discussing our personal feelings makes uh, the finding the definition very hard. So the definition itself is lightly fluid. Uh, also, you can find uh, Emergent gameplay is a phrase that is m mostly connected when we're discussing immersion. What is emergent gameplay? Well, mainly it is that moment when we as creators do not shoehorn the player into a story. We're not, we're not pushing him to finish one certain path. We surround him with enough mechanics, enough things uh, around him so he can play with it around, find something for himself. Games like Zelda Breath of the Wild, games like Minecraft or uh, Metal Gear Solid 5 are games like that. We have so many things and interactions with the world that we can forget about the story for a moment and just create something for ourselves, play with the mechanics. Imagine gameplay is mostly connected to uh, games that are currently on the rise like uh, said Zelda Breath of the Wild, which are systemic games. When we have enough systems in the world that interact with each other and interact with the player himself. 
and what is the immersion fallacy, something that is often forgotten when creating games. Uh, because of our technological advancements, we, for some reason, want to think that if we create something that imitates reality 100%, that it's going to be good. And this is the basic problem of wanting to create something immersive. Games should not be realistic in 100%. If we create a world that copies our own, then there is no game. There is nothing interesting in it because we already have it outside of the windows. So, uh, immersion fallacy is the problem that, uh, for example, is best visualized in old Star Trek when we see the VR rooms in, in, in which everything is real, we can touch, we can interact with it. But immersion, nice suit. <laughs> ah, go back. No, go forth. Uh, oh, please, please, I'll be my guest. Uh, so, <laughs> I'm a little bit shy because of the Pope, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Immersion is not gameplay. When, if you work in game design and work in game dev, uh, do not mistake immersion for gameplay. Immersion is what you feel. Gameplay is what you can do inside the game. So do not by any chance try to recreate the perfect, real, 100% uh, uh, realistic uh, world. Let it always have some bugs, some mistakes, or be a little bit different from our own world. We want to escape from reality when playing games. So, this is basic introduction of what immersion really is. But, uh, we have several tools, as game designers, as creators, uh, to ensure immersion. Uh, it doesn't mean that, because it's gonna be like, ten of those points, it doesn't mean that we have to have all of them. No, the point is to have a specific mixture of things and concentrate on one, two, and push it to the maximum. But let's discuss a few of the tools that we have. Because, uh, first of all, controls. Controls not understood as keyboard or mouse or things that with which you uh, control the game. We also consider things like uh, how me I, as a player, can interact with the game. Using the example of Space Invaders, the controls for the player move left and right and shoot. That's all. That's, there's nothing more. In uh, certain 2D shooters, uh, it might be different, or in different games it will be, of course, different. But when discussing controls, think how you want the player to actually interact with your world. And be sure that that one mechanic is goddamn good. Because if you create a uh, driving game, but your cars suck and you can't turn like 90 degrees, then what's the point of making said game? This is one of the most important things when designing a game and uh, probably the, most, the basic thing that you have to go through. Decisions. Uh, every game has decisions because if it wouldn't have them, it would be just a movie. It's what I, as a player, can do to decide. S sometimes the decision might be, will I live or will I die? For example, like in Mario. Uh, or in other games, it might be complex moral choices uh, in which you have to actually think through what you want to do because it will have many repercussions in the world. So decisions, you always have to think what the player can decide on while playing the game. Progress. Every game has a start, every game has an end. So everything that we have in between is the journey. And now we have to find what kind of a journey it is, how the player is going to record it, because that is important. If I'm going to, I don't know, get experience points, or will I just finish a stage and go to the next world? Progression uh, is a vital point of immersion. Because if I start uh, and end in the same place, what was the point? Progression and how it is shown to the player via UI, uh, in-game mechanics, story, and other things is of course, one of the vital things, as I said, almost with every single thing, but okay, let's move on. Secondly, sound, visuals, story, and world. 
When thinking of sound, do not think about only the background noise that you have or uh, the music score that is inside your game. Uh, when thinking about sound, try to imitate our normal life. Everything has a sound, from this mic to this radiator, people outside the room. Never try to cut down the sound to its bare minimals. If you go next to a club, make sure that that bass line is hearable when you go ne right next to it. Make sure that the word that you're creating is alive. And you can mostly achieve it with sound. Sound is synonymous to life. That's why uh, when there's silence, we feel kind of uncomfortable. We want to hear that something is going on, that there is life around us. So you can use sound in many different ways. Best example that I mm, came up with is uh, Mirror's Edge. Anyone of you uh, played Mirror's Edge? I believe that some of you know it. No, know it? Nod, nodded. Oh. Uh, in that game, uh, the sound of your beating heart uh, was used as a UI. You understood that your character is getting tired and you understood that uh, what you're doing is crucial, hard, or in any way important. And experimenting with sound can overlap with different things, like in Mirror's Edge when you didn't need the UI because the sound uh, was mm, utilized that. Story. <sighs> of course, if you want to create a good game, make sure that you have a good story. It's trivial to say uh, something like that, but in story-driven games, this is the most important part. Because if your story is weak and you want to touch very important, serious uh, things uh, inside your game, it's never going to work. Your story should overlap with every other single tool and be something of itself. Uh, we're going to, of course, touch the story in a uh, later part of the presentation. But uh, without the story, what is the point of... Okay, there are puzzle games that do not have a uh, story. But it is one of the most important things when uh, discussing game design. Uh, sorry, I'm going to be looking at my notes uh, from time to time. I hope uh, you're going to forgive me for that. Uh, the story itself takes us to a completely different world. That's why we want to escape uh, reality. We want to hear something that we haven't encountered on our, uh, on our own. We want to, for a second, be the hero of a story. We want to be that swashbuckler who is uh, the best pirate in the whole world. We want it for a little moment. That's why we create uh, stories like that. World. Well, when we discuss world, what we have to remember most is make it believable. Uh, do not try to create a world that is so different from our own that we have no comparison. Imagine arrives from comparison. If I understand uh, gravity in our normal day life, and I will, mm, and I, and it's shown in the world. Then I can make a comparison. Now I can understand the danger uh, that comes from experiencing uh, things within the world because I can relate to the things that I have experienced in my own life. And uh, immersion is mostly about that, making things believable while using the things that we already know in our normal day life, and using it against the player. Next. Lastly, we have NPCs, characters, and players' sense of curiosity. NPCs bring the world to life because how else can we best get all the information around, uh, from the world? The same way we do in our real life, through conversations, through encounters, through discussions. NPCs are not only guides that tell you the next store is in another town, they also try to envelop you into the world. They might have their own stories, they might have their own quirks, and try to use as many of that as possible. Character, our main hero, the protagonist. Uh, doesn't matter if it's going to be one person, a group, entire civilization, you need to have an avatar. Because if you do not have an avatar, there's no point of trying to achieve any immersion. You need to understand the stakes, you need to understand your role, you need to know who you are 
in said world. And the sense of curiosity. Uh, it's lastly, uh, it's uh, last on the list, although it's the most important thing and the uh, best thing that we can use, because we always want to know what is behind the closed door. We want to know what is the answer to the secret. When we read the book, we want to know what happens on the next page. And utilize that thing in players. Give them a puzzle. They will try to solve it. Uh, tell them that beyond that mountain there is something but you cannot see what. The player will be enticed just by those words to actually go through challenges the whole journey just to find out what's on the other side of the door. Use the player against himself. Okay. We have many types of immersion but I've uh, tried to concentrate mostly on those three because uh, these are the best ones to discuss. We have spatial immersion, we have emotional immersion, and we have tactical immersion, which as you can see are dumped down to just three sentences. What I can see, what I can feel, and what is my task to do? If uh, spatial immersion, we have a open world game and I can see from the top of the mountain everything that is down below me, I can understand the journey that I have to go from one city to the other, that it's a distance. I can understand that if I'm in a closed, claustrophobic room, that it's probably going to be a horror game in which my fear is going to be used against me. Emotional immersion, going back to fear, is utilizing the emotions that we know from our normal day-to-day -day life. Uh, if I don't, for example, I don't need to be a parent to understand the significance of wanting to save my own child. I don't need to be a convicted criminal to understand the motive of vengeance. We already know those emotions, we already know those tropes, we've read books, we've seen movies. We will not probably create something new, but we can utilize the same emotions that have been used throughout to create said emotion inside the game, either to the character, NPCs, or story. Is uh, trying to find the connection between the real life player and his emotions with the emotions that are uh, artificial. And tactical immersion, completing the task. Mostly seen in games like XCOM or other uh, first person shooters like, I don't know, uh, mm, Siege or any other Call of Duty. It is that moment when you do not look about the world that, that carefully. You do not tr concentrate on your emotions, but you know that you have five minutes to complete the task. Kill everyone in the room. That is when you have the immersion because you understand that this is the one thing that I have to do. And by uh, understanding that, I can try to feel like the character. I understand his pain, I understand his commitment, I understand what he is, uh, what will is going to be in front of him. And I, like in games like XCOM or Call of Duty, have a limited time to do so. Uh, spatial immersion, mostly found in games like, uh, open world games like Witcher 3, like Minecraft, uh, Mirror's Edge, uh, 2D shooters, uh, and emotional immersion will be mostly in games like uh, Heavy Rain, when we have very significant, difficult emotions put in the front of the game as the most important thing. Okay, let's go next. Let's go to the world building section. Uh, in this section, I would like to concentrate on two main aspects. First is what we as game designers and game creators concentrate on what is to, to be shown to the player on the screen and what can be uh, explained later via different other methods. And the other thing is how all those things interact with each other so we can create the best experience possible. Because when you think of a game, Things like the world, the mood, the tension, art, everything has to be connected because if you do not uh, connect them, there's going to be a problem in, uh, with immersion or with understanding the world itself. So, uh, here I would like to show you a little clip that you probably know if you have played that game, which is Horizon Zero Dawn. I consider this, it's a minute and a half movie uh, clip, 
I consider this to be one of the best openings and world explanations that we have in games and so right now. Today, we have a ritual to perform, you and I. Here, wear this. It belonged to my daughter. Good. Today, I speak your name, girl. But will the goddess speak it back? the characters are talking about what is shown to us via those visuals the whole village would attend and matriarchs perform the ritual but we are outcasts even so we keep the tribe's rituals otherwise we might become like the faithless old ones who turned their backs on the goddess but their wickedness doomed them to us were left the splendors of creation. Beasts of air, water, earth, and steel. I've counted, it really lasts a minute and a half. And within this minute and a half, we have full understanding of rituals, cosmology, the whole world, how it looks, our potential enemies bond between characters. One minute and a half is enough to show everything if you know what is the most important thing. We have been, uh, they used our own experiences. They talk about the old ones as our generation, the generation of technology. We can understand that because our current times are quite hard and we could end up like this, it's not that far-fetched. We can understand it because we understand that currently the technology is almost at the level of gods compared to our own. So extrapolating this into gigantic monsters that are made purely out of steel is not that far-fetched, as I said. Okay, let's move to the meh. And when you're thinking about the world, especially in the beginning, you have to show all the basic informations within the first 10 minutes. If you do not do that, the player will not be immersed when you want to shoehorn them later. The beginning is the most important part and you have to set up every single thing. I have to understand the world, I have to understand my character, I have to understand what is the stake of the game that I'm playing. And mainly because of that I still consider uh, Horizon Zero Dawn to have the best opening that uh, I have ever seen. Going back to world, mood, and tension. We have different mechanics uh, at our disposal. We can create special mechanics that will enhance the world. It's not only have to be shown like uh, in Horizon, which is beautiful pastel colors. It can be done with various uh, things. For example, in horror games, the sound, the world, and the mechanics go hand in hand to ensure a sense of fright, a sense of us being scared. And if they do not affect each other, the immersion will be broken. We need all of those things to interact and boost each other. If I'm in a game that is a horror game, it has to be dark. And if it has to be dark, what is the source of light? How can I use it? And if I use it, what it will, uh, what it will do? Another clip that I would like you to see for a moment is from a horror game, Amnesia.
I don't know about you, I played this game, but even from that clip I can sense that something is behind me. The music, the fact that the sides of the screen are blurred, are working towards our immersion. Here, in Amnesia, the world is just one big building. The sound almost non-existent, light almost non-existent, but that is what makes the tension and the mood in this game. So you always have to consider what is the setting that I'm doing, what will boost it and what will uh, work against it. Uh, so when thinking about the tools that you have for immersion, always try to create the perfect mixture of few. Never try to achieve to have to use all of the tools, the best of your potential. Always try to focus on two or three that are going to be the, at the pinnacle. And throughout that, you can then create the over, overall gameplay, overall mechanics, and the immersion will arise from the mm, good combination of the tools that we have at hand. Go. As I said. So, a uh, few tips and tricks that you can use uh, for creating a good world-building immersion. First, time and space. Always be sure that you understand how the time works in your game. Do not try to make uh, quick jumps that something happens in a course of a week and then you lose a month, then something goes for a course of a year, then it lasts a day. Always be sure that the progression of time works towards uh, the goal that you have inside your game. The same goes with space. In Amnesia, the space has to be limited so we can uh, feel fried. If it, had, if it would be an open world, I wouldn't get scared because I could easily escape to the, I don't know, any other place. But if the space is confined, then immersion in horror games starts to work. So always consider time and space uh, in the beginning and how you want to show them. Next, use all of the senses that we have. Most uh, of the people when creating games, they try to concentrate on what you hear and what you see. And this is, sorry for the word, bullshit. You have more senses to use. If a player, uh, if a character finds something, tell him that it smells. Tell him that it's icky when you touch it. Uh, you might hear something that is outside the door, not, not just background noise. Uh, with taste, with smell, you can use our own senses from real life to impose certain images into your brain. If you tell the player that something smells, he will always uh, remember about it and he will, and he might even, if the measure is good, actually feel it. Actually feel the nauseating effect that something is smelly. So remember that we have five senses, not two. Always uh, incorporate as many relatable things as possible. The world is immersive, the world is believable when we use things that we understand from our normal world. If, like gravity, which I said before, like other aspects, for example, day and night cycle, use the things that we know and then incorporate into your game and use them, as I said also before, against the player. Uh, the more things I can relate to, understand, the better my immersion because, uh, well, I know them. It's not hard for me to reach and understand them. Everything has a backstory and it always influences the future. Let's say that you have created a game in which every single character flies. If you do not ask yourself a question, then if everyone flies, what is at the bottom of the, of, at the bottom on the, on the earth? This is a very important thing. Everything is connected. Uh, if your world uh, has only horses and carriages, how will the roads look like? You need to understand that. You need to ask yourself those questions because if you do not put those consequences into the world, the player's immersion will be broken in minutes. Uh, that is why the example of people are flying what is on the earth, I consider it to be one of the uh, greatest ones as a, let's say, mind trick that you can do on, your, uh, on yourself. Uh, because it's a, such a different setting that we wouldn't 
normally think about it. And that is the point, to actually make the world believable by thinking of what happened, what will be the consequences, why it happened in the first place. Never break the fourth wall. I know that many people love to do it, like to give a little shout out to the crowd. Uh, the player uh, turns around to the camera and gives a, a stupid wave. Do not do it unless your whole game is about it. It is very hard to break the fourth wall without breaking the immersion indefinitely. Because if in one moment I understand that I am in a game, this will never go away. There are, I can count like on maybe on fingers on my one hand, good examples of when uh, breaking the fourth wall is actually good. Metal Gear Solid 2, a game that is fully about breaking the fourth wall. That is a good example. But uh, if you have a game and you want to do a little Easter egg, don't. Really, don't. It's not that good of an idea. Now, let's go to NPCs. The biggest problem when creating NPCs uh, is the sense of them becoming real. Of course we can create an NPC like in the old games with just a text box, the merchant is in the, another city, Mario, your princess is in another castle. But what we want to do is make them real. We want to actually understand their emotions because only then we will consider them as worthy companions or important people for the story. We'll actually think of them as people. Even if they're, I don't know, aliens. And the second thing that I'm gonna discuss while uh, going through NPCs is what creates a bond between you and an NPC. So, a uh, quick question to the crowd. Do you know who those people are? Anyone? Where? Yeah. Okay, I'll make it easier. Morden? from Mass Effect, and Bastille Shan from uh, Knights of the Old Republic. Why do people consider those two characters to be very important, very memorable? Morden, do a, uh, a task. Try to describe a character from any game without referring to what their job is, what their role is in the game, and just try to find as many adjectives as you possibly can. What can we say about Morden? Smart, cocky, uh, mm, oh, I forgot the English word. Let's go back. Uh, that person is conflicted internally. We understand his motivations. Bastila, when we start the game, she thinks she's the main hero of the game. Only by encountering you and your journey with her, she understands, I am not the chosen one. You are. And from that self-realization of hers, she starts to understand you and you start to understand her because she acts like a normal being. If you consider yourself always to be number one and somebody comes and he's far better than you, well, that is an emotional thing. And conveying that is the best thing that you can do to actually make them believable, make them real. Uh, think of all your uh, relations that you have in normal real, real life, use them. Uh, if you talk to your friends and you have special relations with certain people in your life, think why. What happened in your lifetime so that you consider someone to be your best friend or your greatest enemy or someone that you envy, etc. Use that because that creates good characters. If they are developed far beyond what they show in game. Do, you re do we remember this character? I'll just give a hint, it's from Fallout 3. It's the father. I consider this to be the worst example of an NPC that has been created in uh, modern day video games. Mostly because nothing that is connected to him is connected to us, although he's our father. We meet him for five minutes in the beginning of a game. Then we do not meet him till the last minutes of the game. He has his own quest that we're not so connected to because it's his quest. Why should I care about a person just because they said 
he's my father. We didn't create a bond. I haven't encountered him many times. I didn't have the opportunity to let our relationship evolve. I am shoehorned into his quest. I am an NPC in his story, not the other way around. Okay. Let's go to certain tips and tricks, but before that, uh, how to create a bond. Players, uh, characters can be totally different. We can have them, f uh, like, I don't know, in Playscape Torment or any other game when you create your own squad. You can have people that are completely different from you. But if you give this one certain thing, like the sense of, uh, finding oneself, a journey, a quest that is be, uh, higher, bigger than the characters that we express, it will create a bond because even though we're different, we have a common thing, a common theme to us. And when creating a bond, remember that just like in real life, it evolves in time, in behavior, in things like that. So. When creating NPCs, always make sure that they and your character have something in common. It could be goal, save the earth, do whatever, I don't know, any goal. But also incorporate some differences. Because if you're, you're talking to your companion and he's saying, you're a bad person, why? We can have different morals. Now I can start to uh, be interested in him because he has something to say. He's not just a yes man going, yes master, yes, I will do everything you want. Create some moments when you can uh, have a discussion with another character like in normal day life with any others. NPCs should have their own thing. Let it be a catchphrase like, what are you buying? What are you selling? Or maybe it's just a quirk, or maybe it's something that only this character can do in your world. Make him memorable. May not, let's not make another blacksmith that is classically fat with a hammer. We can create different types of blacksmiths and we can make them memorable by adding something that is unique to them or unique in the world. Do not try to think of NPCs as flat and as a guides to what you as a character as the main hero want to achieve npcs do not wait for the hero they have their own lives if an npc is always in the same position doing absolutely nothing what is the sense of consequence that we have nothing goes no, no, nothing is alive in this world if the npc changes places works around, maybe something happened, you, maybe you've done something like destruction of a city and now he understands it and it impacts his life. Now he becomes someone real. Now he has something to do, he may, might have his own motivation. Hero is just a person that pushed the world a little bit further, but if he did, it has consequences on everything, especially on the people that live inside said world. What if your companion says no? You take a guy on a mission and he says, nah, not doing it. Why? That is a funny thing. You consider your companions as just your posse, someone that you can get, ah, he's useless, he'll just die probably on this mission, but I need someone. And he says no, because I don't like you, because you're a dick. I don't like you. The player would just be baffled why does a game say to me, no, I'm the main character? You always should say yes. Think about that. And, as I said, relationship grow. You have your friends, you have your family, see how your relationship has uh, influenced you and how it has changed throughout your years. It's not just that the story goes forth and with that we understand that oh, me and my companion has, have achieved something. Also behaviors. Maybe after those 10 missions, that NPC that goes uh, around you will now pat you on the back and say good job. 
or maybe they'll have some intimate relationship with you, like uh, in a game that explores romance between characters. Uh, not let's make the characters not only talk but also feel something, show that expression. And uh, MGS5, uh, one of my favorite games, so that's why I'm using it as an example so often. Uh, if you go with your companions on many missions, they will start to appear in cutscenes. They will start to interact with you in ways you haven't even thought of. And that is that sense of uh, growth of your relationship. That person is now more involved in your life than it was ever before. Okay, so we've talked about NPCs, let's go to characters. In this part, I'm gonna touch two main things. Who is the main character? And what is the sense of progression that we want to convey while creating that character and then using it throughout the whole game? Main character is not just the guy uh, on whom the camera focuses. He is the most important thing in that world. He is the thing that pushes everything forward. Everything is dependent on the main character. Think of a world, extract that character. Would, everything, would anything change? These are the questions that we, that we have to ask when trying to create a believable character. We probably all know who this guy is, yes? Probably. Why is he one of the most iconic characters when all he can do is jump and run? He is the perfect balance to the game mechanics that have been created. Remove Mario from the world. The princess is done for, nothing changes. The world stays exactly as it was without him, but he, with just jumping and running. He is the most important thing. He changes the history. He becomes the actual hero. He pushes everything forward. Uh, the protagonist always should be within the limits of the game that you create. Try to find what that character could or should do in order to change the world that you're creating. Another example, Snake from Metal Gear Solid. This is about a little bit about progression. We start with a guy with two eyes, end up with a guy with an, uh, one eye. What the hell happened? If, you do, uh, if you're thinking about progression, try to show it not only via stats, not only with you have attained level 10, you have went to world number five, your character, the same as the game evolves. The sense of progression should be visible on the character. Maybe he's tired, maybe his clothes are torn, maybe he becomes a totally different person because of what happened to him. Show that he has a struggle because being the main character is not easy. You're Come on, in the middle of the total shitstorm and you have to somehow rescue everyone. Well, oh, that's not easy. Protagonist. Mm. Let's think about him as... Uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought for a second here. That's the second time today. Not good. So let's go to tips and tricks. Sorry, I'm a little bit stressed, there are so many people. Tips and tricks. Do not make your character bigger than the story. He should be an integral part of the story. He should have only those uh, abilities that you can show and that are important in the game. If you try to make a very dark character brooding with a lot of stuff going uh, inside of him and your game is not about that, then what is the point? You are creating a character that no one is going to believe in, no one is going to get immersed because I do not understand him. I do not know what is going inside of him. Sometimes it's not needed. For example, Mario doesn't need to have emotions, yet because of his simplicity, we are immersed 100%. Because I don't believe that any one of you, when the Mario jumped down, didn't shout, Mario, you fool. You didn't shout at yourself, you shout at the character. Do not make him bigger than a story. 
especially in story-driven games, if you want the character to be believable, give him a little success. Especially in the field in which he's going to later have a big failure. Let's see that I can do something, I can win, I can beat the race. Then we're interested in what change that I failed in the next time. Uh, the failure never uh, tastes better than when you first won something, because now you understand the disparity. Now you understand, I want to be the winner, I don't want to lose, I want to be the best. And through failure, we learn what we can do and what we can't. Hard times create tough people. Value comes from challenge. If I have succeeded in many types of encounters, in many types of battles. Now I know what I can do more, what I can do better. Now the challenge is not only about that there are more, uh, more many, uh, many more enemies. Now the challenge might arise from, I am a badass and I know how to deal with you, so I'm gonna be a little bit more creative. I'm gonna try to approach it from a different approach, uh, a different appro approach, approach. Uh, I'm gonna approach it from a different, different perspective. Instead of killing your character, make him fight for his life. Uh, in many games, the death is very simple, binary. You live, you die, that's it, repeat. But what if you actually create a arc, a part of a story, a single plot when the character has to fight for it. Now my life becomes more important. It's just not, ah, oh, death, restart, blah, that doesn't matter. Now because I have fought for it, now because I have invested something in my character and I have won uh, with adver uh, adversity that was thrown uh, in front of me, now my character becomes more tougher. Now death matters. Every character needs some time to think to recuperate. If the whole game is battle after battle after battle, and I have no single time to sit down, relax, think what just happened, I'm going to have sensory overload. And when I see the fifth battle, I'm not going to get emotional about it, because I didn't see the meaning of the battle. It's just one encounter after another. So if you want the character to actually understand the difficulty of the challenge that is in front of him, make him wait a little bit. Think about the wounds that he's got. Or maybe give him a little bit time to understand what the hell just happened. Maybe in the last scene there was a major plot twist. If he goes from that to another battle, that plot twist didn't matter. You, uh, the same as the character, need some time to think to wrap your head around certain things that have happened. Story. Two things. Free arc structure and the twist. Free arc structure is something that has been developed uh, many, many, many years ago. It is one of the most basic ways to actually create a story, no matter if it's a series, no matter if it's a book, no matter if it's a game. It works with story-driven motifs. And when we're going to discuss the twist, there is a need in many people to have to create the best twist ever created. And most of the people do it wrong. So let's see what are the most basic things that we need to understand when designing a twist. So let's go to the free arc structure. Uh, is the graph visible? That uh, it is somewhat visible. Okay, so let's concentrate on it. This is graph of how a free arc structure should work. We divide our game, our series, whatever, into three main parts. First one, the exposition. We show our hero, we show our world, we show what is the conflict that is inside this world. Uh, we introduce everything without trying to overload the hero with uh, the, the player and the hero with useless information. 
when discussing the free arc structure, I'm going probably uh, many times use uh, Star Wars, the original trilogy, as an example because it's a, one of the best examples of how to create a good uh, free arc structure. So in relation, in the beginning, what are we shown? Our main protagonist, Luke. We are not in the middle of the fight between the rebellion and the empire. We start small. We introduce the basics. We introduce our characters, his friends, and that there is a conflict somewhere, somewhere around. Time? You're kidding me. Uh, okay. Uh, in the exposition, you concentrate on showing uh, everything that is in the beginning. In the midpoint, you give the biggest thing that changes the entire world. Like, for example, the rebellion is crushed in half. In the last part, the climax, and this is the biggest mistake that everyone does, the climax of the story is not the last thing that you do. You still have this space to actually resolve the climax, give the player a little bit of time to understand what is going on, and then do a celebration. The end of the, uh, the climax is not the end of the movie, not the end of the game. When to end an act, why the climax? Uh, okay, let's, four minutes, okay. Uh, God damn. I think, ah. Uh, movie. Stop. What you got? Stop, what okay, you I'm gonna for a second. Uh, twist. Has anyone played Bioshock, the first one? Oh, okay, some people have. I'm sorry for the spoilers, uh, but this game was launched like, I don't know, 15 years ago, so tough luck. Uh, in this game, we are shown one of the best twists in the game. We are introduced to the phrase, would you kindly? No, come on, play. You can do it. You have like two minutes. Do it. Do it. Do it. Next slide. Uh, Oh, sorry. Work. Stop. What you got? What a you twist find? works best if it is introduced oh, early, friends. at least in some point. Familiar. Our main character has always heard the words "Would you kindly, would you kindly, would you kindly get this? Would you kindly game. find that? Would you kindly find that? Would you kindly find that? Would you kindly get this? Would you kindly head to Ryan's office and kill the son of a bitch?" And at this moment, we realize that we have been brainwashed Sit. the entire game. Would you kindly? This is the twist. When we show in the beginning something, when we have give the time for the idea to grow a little bit, when we realize from our past experience, oh my god, I've had all the hints beforehand. A good twist works best when you use a little bit of misdirection and you use subtle foreshadowing. These are the two most important things when devising a twist. But when you think about it, always do a test run and approach the twist from the perspective of the player. Something that is very often forgotten from the perspective of game design. Because people think, oh, of course they're gonna believe my twist. But if you do not test it, if you do not think it from the perspective of the player, someone will, might miss it. Quickly, tips and tricks for the story. Why would we tell stories by the campfire in the ancient times and way before that? Because it was private. When you are creating a story, make it a little bit private. Make sure that the player thinks that he is a part of something that is only for the selected few. Cutscenes intensity loop. If you have cutscenes, do not push one after another, one after another. This is goes to that point of uh, giving the player a little bit of time to actually think about it. If you do a big battle scene, then cut it with a cat scene, so the uh, player can concentrate on something different. Be sure that you give enough time to the player to actually understand what is going on in the game. Uh, you need to know this whole story before, <laughs> before you start it. Yes, that is very common. People think about the ending only in mid-production and then they understand that the story is shit. I think we all know the series Lost. Avoid trying to resolve every plot in the last 10% uh, of the game. If you do, the player will not understand half of it. Try to resolve minor things beforehand and only the most important things leave for the ending of a game. Right place, right time, right methods. Delivery 
is everything. You've created a badass NPC, badass story, and a badass twist. But if you do it in a wrong moment, nobody will care. It won't work. Always try to figure out when is the best time to do a twist. And going back to the three arc structure, it's in the second arc. Never in the last one, and never in the first one. <coughs> Inspiration can be anywhere. Of course, all the stories have been already created. We know the romance, we know horror, we know action. Do not try to create something that has never been done by anyone else. Use the stories that you know, but tell them your own way. Use them to... You're not gonna be uh, shocked when somebody says, I love you, I hate you. So these are common tropes. Try to tell them your way, but the inspiration is everywhere. And always make sure that you leave no plot holes and things unresolved. If you do that, the player will concentrate mostly on the things that he did not see than the things that he did. Always make sure that everything is close. When you see the end credits, there are no questions. Or at least there shouldn't be. It works only in few types of games. So, quick summary. Relatable means uh, believable. Use your own experiences for the benefit of the game. If the world is dead, the immersion is unexistent. Everything should be alive. Sound, people, walking. The world needs to be alive. You, as a player, need to see that there are consequences of your actions. Anything can be shown expressed in more than one way. Do not concentrate only on visuals. Try to incorporate different senses, different methods, different mechanics. What if you use a keyboard in more than just a controller? This is doable. It's hard, but it's doable. And you can always try to figure out at least one, two, three more ways how you can do such things. <sighs> Allow the player to explore not only the world, but the story and character as well. If you give an open world, emotions, everything else inside the game should be explored the same way as you ride your horse throughout the whole game. Uh, if you do not, why bother with creating emotions and other tropes in your game? And players, characters' journey is never uphill. We know this from our normal day life. We have never been just on the winning streak. Let the player lose. The failure is something that creates the best taste for the moment when you win. Immersion is not gameplay. It's related to immersion fallacy and the whole presentation uh, as a whole. Immersion is a good thing that you can achieve, but the first thing that you should concentrate on is the actual gameplay. Sorry that the last part had to be so fast, and thank you for listening.